So good morning, everyone. Thank you for being with us uh, for the third seminar, webinar of the first series of uh, Italy-German webinars. Uh, uh, the series is called Sensor Systems and Measurements. <coughs> and uh, today the seminar, uh, the title of the seminar is Novel Functional Materials for Biosensing. My name is Matteo Pardo. I am the, in the Office for European and International Relations of uh, the National Research Council, CNR. And the uh, organizer with me of the series is my successor as science attaché in Berlin, Professor Vincenzo Fiorentini. As always, we will have two speakers uh, today, one German and one Italian, actually one from a German institution and one from, from CNR. <laughs> And uh, from CNR, we have Vincenzo Palermo, which I will introduce shortly. And from Germany, we have Andreas Titel from the Nano Institute in München uh, of the Ludwig Maximilians University. Um, so as I said, this is the third um, webinar. Stay tuned for a possible fourth uh, mm -hmm. seminar in May. We are still organizing it. Um, so that's all for introductory words from me. Maybe I just add that you, the speakers, were nice enough to send us the presentations beforehand so you can download them uh, under document or documents on the right hand side. There are the two PDF files. You just can download them in order to follow the presentations in the best possible way. And while they are speaking or anytime, you can. Uh, uh, write down your questions uh, under demanded questions, uh, always on the right hand side, and uh, they will um, answer, we will read to them and, and they will answer at the end of their uh, webinar. Uh, so say, having said that, uh, please Vincenzo, your introductory words. Okay, yeah. uh, <coughs> shall I uh, no, become presenter yeah. and share the, the slides? There's a bit no, of confusion because people. there's an excess of Vincenzo's here today. There are two Vincenzo's. <laughs> it's 100% excess. Now I will just say hello. My name is Vincenzo Fiorentini. I'm with the Italian Embassy in Berlin. Uh, in real life, I'm a physicist, so I'm not, I'm not a, a spy here today. So I bring greetings from the, from the embassy, from our head of mission, Ambassador Barricchio. And uh, I think that's it. And I give, uh, or back to Matteo. Okay, so I, I introduce uh, um, Professor Vincenzo Palermo, who will uh, speak first, and, uh, and then we will have the, the, the second seminar by Andreas. Uh, um, so Vincenzo Palermo, we are very happy to have uh, him here today. He is the director of CNR Institute, the Institute for Organic Synthesis and Photoreactivity. Uh -huh. Which is located in Bologna, and he has uh, a double hat, as we were uh, discussing before uh, before the uh, meeting uh, between us. He is a professor at the uh, University Chalmers, uh, Chalmers University of Technology in Sweden, and uh, he had the important role of being vice. He used to be the uh, vice director of the Graphene Flag, and I believe he will tell us something about this flagship, because the idea of these webinars is to show big things which are going on in, in CNR and also in Germany. Uh, so like flagships, uh, research infrastructures. Uh, we had two um, research infrastructure in the first two webinars. Um, so continuing with uh, Vincenzo Palermo, he has a, a vast uh, scientific production of more than 180 papers in uh, journals in chemistry and material science. He collaborated with uh, uh, key partners, also private partners in Europe, from Airbus to FCA to Leonardo, Nokia and ST Microelectronics. He won uh, prizes such as the uh, Lecturer Award for Excellence of the Federation of European Materials uh, Societies and the Research Award of the Italian Society of Chemistry and the Science Dissemination Award of the Italian Book Association. So he has also, let's say, an experience in disseminating, which is what he will be doing now, because the focus is, is, is not a, a strict sectorial one of these web webinars. We also always instruct the speakers that they have a presentation which is understandable to a broad audience, not of 
persons from their specific sector who will listen to the presentation at the conferences. So having said this, please, Vincenzo, I give you the floor and wait a moment. Okay. Okay, thanks. I will. Uh, <clears throat> okay. Okay. Uh, hello to everybody, and uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, Matteo and, and, and Vincenzo and, and the Italian Embassy for organizing this cycle of, of seminars. Uh, it's uh, it's good that now we, we can have this virtual meeting, hoping uh, to, to also meet in person uh, soon. And uh, as uh, 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 as uh, Matteo said, uh, I have a double affiliation. Uh, now I work full time for the uh, National Research Council of Italy. In particular, I am located in the CNR research area of Bologna, which is in the north of Italy. It's a pretty large area that hosts several institutes of, of CNR and also of other institutions. Uh, uh, up to 1,000 among researchers, students, and technicians overall. Before that, I worked several, uh, several years in Sweden, in Gothenburg, for Chalmers University of Technology. And I still have uh, some collaboration and some activities here, even if today I will uh, present mostly results uh, obtained at CNR in Italy. So most of the, uh, my presentation will uh, deal with the graphene and, uh, and graphene-related materials. Uh, I, I guess you all have heard about this new material, and uh, I'll try to introduce it and explain why we like it so much. So let's start from one century ago when we first learned how to do polymers. Uh, these were simple molecules, uh, no exotic atoms, mostly carbon, and there were already a lot of carbon-containing molecules. But when we got reached the ability to arrange these carbon atoms in long one-dimensional lines, we got polymers and this led to the plastic revolution. Now graphene is a very interesting material, but beyond the specifics of the single material, what I want to underline is that since few years, for the first time, we can produce large quantities of uh, materials that, where atoms are not arranged in one dimension, but in two dimensions. So we move from some spaghetti-like uh, type of molecules. Now we can make also these nano sheets of carbon, but also of other atoms. And besides the physical and electronic properties or chemical properties of the specific material, Already the possibility to create such kind of two-dimensional building blocks uh, is already allowing to create new architectures and new materials. This said, of course, there are hundreds of two-dimensional materials, nanosheets that we can build, uh, but of course the most famous is graphene. Its properties were first identified in 2004 and then there was uh, the, the Nobel Prize in 2010. And it's really a remarkable material. Graphene is made of carbon atoms, all arranged to form nanoscopic sheets. So these sheets are two-dimensional, of course. Uh, they are monoatomic, so they are truly one atom thin, but they can span tens of microns inside. And this hexagonal structure is like a, a, an atomic chicken wire. It's very stable. So you can flex, you can stretch, you can pull these sheets. It's uh, chemically stable, it can stay in air, it's uh, in water, it's, uh, it's really inert. Uh, if you, this is the, the base component of pencils. If you throw a pencil in water, it will not rust, you can then still write with, with it. But being based on carbon chemistry, you can really play with its chemistry and tune its properties. And its properties are outstanding. So uh, graphene has very good mechanical properties, uh, better than steel at the nanometric level, uh, very good for electronics, high, high charge mobility, much better than silicon, which is at the base of all of our transistor. High electrical conductivity or thermal conductivity, better than metal. So it's really a remarkable material. 
it's like uh, sometimes I say it's like if one single person could beat all the gold medal uh, champions in, in uh, at the Olympics in very different disciplines. One single material can really uh, outmatch uh, different the, the top of the class in, in, in different classes. Then this, of course, refers to the properties of the single nano sheet at nanometric level. It's not straightforward to use these properties then at the macroscopic scale. This notwithstanding, already a few years after the first uh, isolation of graphene, methods to mass produce it were found and then it came to consumer products, first in tennis, then in skis. Now there are lots of companies doing um, graphene-based products, mostly in the sport field. There is also a a pretty large Italian company called Victoria that uh, that makes bicycles with the, with graphene. Most most mature applications are in composites, but in last year's application in in functional devices like transistor heaters, headphones, are also found their, their way. Nothing still breakthrough or life changing, but the, if you go on Amazon, you will see many of these products. But as I said, now we will focus on, on the material itself. And as I said, the possibility to have this kind of flexible sheet that is nanometric and you can process it in different ways uh, allows us to make new kind of architecture. So graphene sheets can be considered as a molecule, so you can produce, functionalize it, you can process them in solution, but they are pretty big, so they can be considered as a substrate. You can pattern them, a small molecules can be grafted on graphene or even nanocrystals. You can make layered architectures. So really the, the only limit is, is uh, imagination. It's uh, like to, to make an example if uh, 2D materials, graphene and, and not only, were a new ingredients that we had in, in our nano uh, portfolio of, of instruments to create new materials. And of course, graphene on its own, maybe it's not so interesting, uh, but if you combine it with other kinds of components, the final results can be much, much better than the simple sum of the components. And that's what we try to do in our group. So try to use graphene not as a Jacob all trade or wonder material that alone can solve things, but try really to combine it in composites and, and try to solve things. And we uh, work a lot on, on uh, composites for mechanics, energy storage, water purification. Uh, but today I will focus mostly on uh, uh, graphene-based electrodes. So, uh, as I said, graphene is flexible, chemical inert, is a good conductor, and there are a lot of, of uh, there is a lot of work to use it as electrodes, mostly in batteries. So, like the anode, but in some cases also the cathode of uh, lithium-ion or sodium-ion batteries. Uh, we'll not talk about this uh, today, but. Uh, uh, also for, let's say, more uh, uh, different application in the sensor sen uh, sector, in the photovoltaics, in the biomedical sector. Why should we use graphene instead of uh, mature technology like metal electrodes? Because it's already a, a mature application, so you can really buy a4 side sheets of, of, of graphene, you can buy monolayer graphene on, on wafer scale, you can buy kilograms or tons of graphene or graphene oxide in powders, in solution. So it's it's a young material, but it's it's already pretty available also at the industrial level. Uh, then it's made of carbon. And carbon, uh, usually in, in biological or in polymers, is not very conductive, but if you think to graphite or conductive polymers, can be very, very conductive. And graphene, as I said, can beat in conductivity uh, several metals. Because it's carbon, it's ideal also to interact with living objects. So it uh, will, uh, will have maybe less adverse reaction than heavy metals if uh, exposed to biological fluid, to aggressive fluids, graphene will not oxid oxidize like metals. Uh, even more, the best 
chemistry we have is carbon-based chemistry. All organic chemistry is based on carbon reactivity. So once we have a platform made of carbon, we can really play with its chemistry very well. And last but not least, of course, if you are talking about disposable devices, uh, it's, uh, it's better to recycle carbon or even burn carbon than, than uh, metals like uh, copper, or silver, uh, or, or heavy metals in general. As I said, one of the main advantages of carbon is, is its really versatile chemistry. Here we see two examples. These are both two-dimensional materials. On the left side, you see graphene, the very famous graphene, and you see this beautiful, perfect, uh, defectless uh, lattice of uh, honeycomb uh, lattice, uh, all made of, of carbon atoms. And this is the graphene that won the Nobel Prize, so incredible physical, electrical, and mechanical properties. If we destroy this, this lattice, oxidizing it, we change the, the, the perfect uh, sp2 hybridization of graphene into something a bit more disordered. So we attach oxygens here and there. We obtain graphene oxide. So this is basically oxidized graphene. And here we, we lose a lot of electric properties. Mechanical properties go down. So this is not a Nobel Prize winning material, but it has some advantages because Purity and the lack and perfection is not always a good thing because graphene being so perfect tends not to interact too much with other, uh, with other molecules as examples. So it's not, does not like a lot of solvents. It's not very soluble, uh, tends to stack on each other to form graphite again. So it's, uh, if, if you want to have high electrical conductivity, you should, should use graphene. But if you want to process something, as example in water, which is the ideal thing for, for um, industrial application, graphene oxide is much more friendly, processable, uh, and soluble of graphene. So it's really easy to move it around and to deposit it exactly where you want. The good thing with graphene is that you don't have to choose between one and the other, but you can really tune uh, where to stop between graphene and graphene oxide, or you can even directly uh, pro, uh, produce graphene oxide that is partially oxidized, or even once you've done, gone to graphene oxide, you can go back and reduce it back again. So you can take graphene, you oxidize it, you put it and where you want, you can process it in water, and then you can reduce it back again to have something conducted that it's not exactly graphene, you don't remove all the defects, but it's good enough for many applications, as we will see. You can even go directly from graphene to this partially conductive reduced graphene oxide by electrochemical exfoliation. And given that we are talking about electrochemical sensors, I will also spend some words more about, about this. As I said, the graphene is obtained from graphite. You exfoliate graphite usually by sonication by chemical methods, but there is also a better way that is, because graphite is conductive, you can really uh, use electrochemistry. So you apply a, a very small electric bias to graphite or graphite minerals. You can do it this even with normal pencils. If you make the central part of pencil and you clip some, uh, some uh, electrical contacts to, uh, there, you can really see uh, these this kinds of, of process and electrochemistry going on. So you can directly produce electrochemically exfoliated graphene oxide that uh, uh, then is soluble and you can tune how much solubility and how much defects do you want. So how did, do we, did we use this material for electrochemical sensors? Well, we started from uh, commercial sensors. We had also a collaboration with the company producing them. And uh, this is how they look like. So basically you have three sensors. Uh, you could do it even with two sensors. So the, the, the active sensor where you really do the measurement, a counter electrode that uh, of course is needed to have a current flowing, but usually you need also a reference electrode that measure precisely the the potential, the electric potential you are applying. Usually this uh, 
uh, sensors are made of inks or um, let's say um, conductive inks made of silver but also carbon uh, whose surface is, is a bit disordered and, and uh, not really controlled. So what we did was to take our uh, graphene, on, in this case graphene oxide, coat it on this substrate and we can either keep it as it is, so the soluble version, or we can reduce it electrochemical so that we go partially back to graphene, so we can really tune the amount of, of uh, defects that are there. And here you see an image of these screen printed electrodes, the original one, so you see how there are all these conductive particles. When you coat them, you have a much flatter uh, surface, and this is the, the central image is uh, uh, these kinds of electrodes coated by graphene oxide. So it's partially insulating, uh, but then electrochemically or thermally, even chemically, you can reduce it. And in this case, because you are on an electrode, it's very easy just to apply a negative potential and you reduce this graphene oxide, going back to reduce graphene oxide. And of course, you can tune it very well because in this case, uh, applying minus 1.25 volts, you, you, you get to a, a certain reduction grade. You can apply a higher or lower voltages uh, and, and the stop where you want. Then the detection of the analyte, so the sensor works at positive potential, so you don't have, uh, you don't modify your electrode anymore. And as you can see, it seems that from the Electron microscopy images, not much changes. So the, the surface remains flat with these small ripples that are due to these large sheets that have been deposited on top. But when you do the reduction, of course, the chemistry changes a lot. And you can follow this with the special uh, technique called X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy. I will not go into details of this, but this technique can really measure on the surface which kind of atoms do you have? So if you have carbon, iron, silicon, what oxygen, whatever. But also the type of chemical bonds that are on the surface. So uh, in, in a carbon-based material, you usually have lots of different uh, carbon bonds, like uh, COC bonds, carboxylic bonds. Uh, if you have all graphene, you have, of course, only one type of bond, which is the carbon-carbon double, uh, double bonds that form the, the hexagons. And, but here is, is not the case. So analyzing all the spectra, we could see how the chemistry of graphene changes at different, uh, applying different voltages. So in the left graph that you see here, Going from right to left, we go from graphene oxide to reduce graphene oxide. And I will not go into details of this, but you can see the different chemical groups and how they change, they disappear or they increase, going uh, more, uh, doing more and more reduction. And the one that the most dramatic change is the number of CC double bonds that increase. And these are, as I said, at the, indicate that we are restoring this hexagonal lattice forming graphene. And these are also the, the bonds that are responsible for electrical conductivity. So when we go from right to left, this the number of these double bonds increases. If we measure at the charge transfer, so that the electrical conductivity the, or the resistance of the electrode uh, you see in the right graph, it's the, the electrical resistance, it also goes down. So there is a direct correlation between the chemistry of the material and its electrical properties. And uh, we'll talk about more uh, in, uh, in detail of this uh, later on. So we use these coatings as electrodes and uh, uh, one typical molecule that we try to detect is uh, this uh, molecule called beta-nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. Is, uh, it's a coenzyme involved in, in lots of, of important process in, in living cells. Uh, that's not exactly my field. I, I'm more focused on, on the materials, but uh, I can tell you that uh, it's you know, a pretty standard and important molecule to detect in, in uh, biological environments. 
So here you see the uh, response of the electrodes that was tuned at different uh, positive voltages. And these are different electrodes that were reduced at different degrees. So uh, <clears throat> you see graphene oxide, so as deposited and then reduced graphene oxide, reduced at different potential. You can see that there is a big change, a significant change. So when you use more and more reduced uh, graphene oxide electrodes, you see that there is a P1 peak that then decreases and shifts a bit, and then there is also formation of a second peak. And, okay, and, hello, do you hear me? Hello? Yes, yes. I think we there was you, a but we lost. Yeah, because yeah. The, the, the screen, uh, Okay, you're back. The, uh, yeah, I'll try to share again. Okay, let's see. Yes. Okay, I'll go back to... Okay, okay so why this happens? Well, it's it's... Of course, these are complex molecules that are interacting not with the perfect graphene, but with the complex surface. But anyhow, the, the, the evidence we got, and, and uh, you can see more details in, in this paper that we published uh, in 2017, is that uh, uh, these kinds of molecules need to have a, a conductive substrate where to adsorb on, uh, but they also need some kind of chemical groups oxygen containing chemical groups to favor this absorption. And uh, once they are there, because they are already absorbed on the surface, uh, the over potential need, uh, needed uh, to, to oxidize them is, is lower. So uh, you can detect these molecules at a low, applying a lower potential. And this in sensor is very good because of course, the higher potential you apply, the more molecules you are oxidizing. And uh, we should imagine that uh, we have not, in a real situation, a, a pure solution with just one molecule. We have lots of different things. We, all, all, we should always have problems with uh, uh, cross talk and, and uh, uh, false positives, as we have seen also in, in last years. Everybody has become a bit expert about doing tests. It's, uh, it's very important, of course, that you can detect your target analyte, also in presence of lots of other things. And how is this? So we see here another a simplified graph in which we have this P1 peak and this other peak coming up when we go from graphene oxide to reduce graphene oxide. And here you can see in the center, in the second graph, you can see that we plot the P1, position of P1 peak and the height of P2 peak at different kinds going from graphene oxide to reduce graphene oxide. And you can see that this is uh, pretty, pretty resembling also the amount of carbon oxygen ratio in the composition that we got from XPS and also similar to the conductivity. So we can see a direct correlation between the chemistry of the material and the, the, the performance of these electrodes. So it seems that you really need more and more of these sp2 carbon atoms to favor the absorption of these molecules and to to have this enhanced detection at lower uh, at lower potential and uh, this this was that was with nadh but we even tried uh, we, we it's pretty robust uh, mechanism we even tried uh, it with the detection of other analyte, which is ascorbic acid, commonly known as vitamin C. And also here, the, the, the details are different, but also in this case, you see these kinds of, of shift to lower potential, so to easier detection of these kinds of materials. And to cut the short story, in the last years, we, we did different works detecting different kinds of, of biological analytes of different interests or from NADH to vitamin C, but also morphine, uh, glucose. And uh, this has been a work that I, I should say will not have been possible without 
collaboration with uh, Chiara Zanardi that uh, is an associate member of my institute but is a professor she's recently moved to the University Caffo Oscari in, in Venice and uh, she is really the specialist on, on sensors and sensing and, and uh, we really took big advantage uh, in, in, uh, and that's how we, we could use our materials for this really specialized field. So these were all, uh, let's say, lab works, um, but of course in, in the real environment, uh, uh, for real sensors, uh, it's, the situation is much more complex because you don't just dip your electrode in a solution when there is only your material and the concentration is stable. As example, if you want to have a sensor that detects your uh, status when you when you run, uh, of course you, your your status and the concentration of analytes will change in your sweat, as example, on your skin. So for all these sensor, you should test if they are reproducible. So having the same measurements with time. If they have some memory effect, so should they should have measure a high concentration, then a low, then a high, you, you should not go linear. That's why we even have to set up a special uh, process to, to simulate this dynamic flow of sweat that you have in a sensor. So in, in practice, in the lab, you have a reservoir and you have a, a, a drain uh, tank where the sweat will evaporate and this ev evaporation will dry, drive a continuous flow of your solution on the electrode so that you can dynamically, in what is called flow injection analysis, measure what happens. And this simulates a bit what happens in, in, in the real situation. So what uh, I showed how we did, did coatings on commercial electrodes, but then we said, can we do better? Because the, the all the technology, all the work done of graphene has uh, allowed it to use graphene, but also has allowed it to produce in a cheaper way, a material that is, is not a nanomaterial. So this is not, nothing fancy, but it's, it's really interesting. So as, as you know, graphene is made from graphite. We have graphite, that is the one that is common, that we use in our pencil. And we know that it's a very hard, brittle material. But now, thanks to all the work done on graphene, we can exfoliate this graphite and use the single sheets of graphene, as I showed in the previous uh, slides. But we can even reassemble graphene in, uh, in a bulk material. So this, is a, this can be a very thick material. And the sheets will not pack as nicely as in graphite. So you, you have something that is more disordered than graphite. But as I said, the defects often are a good thing. So because of this defectivity, this is not brittle anymore, it's highly conductive, but it's flexible. So it's a, a flexible sheet of graphite that uh, is commonly called graphene paper or graphite paper. And this is not a nanomaterial, but it's, uh, it's really like graphite, like graphene is chemically inert, mechanically stable, and we, we have used it for flexible electrodes for different ways. So uh, this is uh, not strictly nanotechnology, but it's very useful material that is really cheap and, and we applied it in, in different ways. As an example, one of the first work that we did was to use it uh, uh, as antennas to replace metals. So what we did, this is a work done in collaboration with Nokia NST Microelectronics. You can make uh, NFC antennas, that one that you typically have in your credit card or a ski pass to, to go around. And you can really replace completely the metal with these conductors, all made of carbons, and they've been tested like one million bending cycles, and they can really outperform metal. Uh, in this other work done in collaboration with their bus, instead we use it as an electrical conductor to embed it in carbon fiber reinforced polymers. So uh, because it's carbon, it's uh, uh, affinity with these polymers and carbon fiber is much better. The goal here is to include it in, in airplanes. You know that most of airplanes now are made of carbon fibers. One problem is that sometimes you need to heat these airplanes 
because they are covered in ice and of course that's very dangerous for safety and here we see this this work in, that we do in collaboration with Airbus to to really use this graphing paper for for application but uh, this was just examples of things that are at higher TRL that we are already doing at the prototype level what we did was also to use these kinds of material for electrode so in this case the graphene is not just a coating on an electrode but it's really a, a, the electrode itself so you can have this G, G paper and you pattern with laser this this electrode you can make these three electrodes that I did you have to coat one a bit with the with silver but then and sorry it has crashed again I don't know why it's doing like this but uh, because I recently changed the computer it's always a Mac but it's uh, it's really uh, there there should be some problem Okay, and so we use this as electrodes, and uh, there was some um, uh, some uh, characterization. We compared it even with commercial inks, and it, it works pretty well. And, and uh, of course, we are really interested in using it because of its flexibility. And this is a paper that we published recently, last uh, last year. Uh, as I said, this was compared with lots of other kinds of materials. So, uh, in, uh, in sensitivity, limit of detection, linear range. I will maybe not not uh, detail here, but you can refer to this paper here, or you can ask me for, for more details later on. This was, let's say, all fundamental work, so lab research work. But we are actively involved also in in practical work trying to help European industries to use graphene technology. In particular, I've been involved and, and uh, been the vice director of the graphene flagship. This is uh, a very large European project founded by the European Union. Uh, it has uh, a duration of 10 years, so it will end next year. It involves a large amount of partners, at the moment 140, uh, 1,200 uh, researchers involved and all this network has been set up with one very precise ob objective so to translate these nice properties of graphene from lab to industry and I should say that when, when we started we of course were optimistic but of course we didn't know if it was going to work but it seemed to work pretty well so according of course I, I mean this project I should say that it, it worked but also according to all the different companies that are in the flagship and even continue to ask joining the flagship and also to the evaluation of external reviewers of the EC, it, it has been a really successful project. And more than the evaluation, you can really see that there is an ongoing very strong interest in, in industrial application of graphene. And we are actually running inside the flagship uh, 11 different projects, uh, all very, very applied, very focused. Each of these projects is coordinated by a large European industry, and they all are trying to develop new application of, of graphene. Um, these are called spirit projects, and in particular, I will focus on one that we we performed with uh, Nokia and other companies called Aural Metrom, which is the company that produced the the electrode I showed before and, and several academic partners about uh, uh, applying what I showed you in, in a real prototype for sensing uh, of stress and, and different analytes on the skin as example while while running. So the goal Do was the, yes that was to develop a prototype that was actually working because of course demonstrating in the lab is is easy but uh, uh, in the real system you have to uh, detect different kinds of analytes and you have to detect it in real time that's how it works so we develop a, a multiple electrode able to do multiple readings uh, this was mounted in a belt and uh, of course 
uh, you should do tests that uh, it's reproducible, as example, to detect the glucose. It does not react to other kinds of uh, materials that you find. And uh, I will just show a simple uh, video showing that often the difficult part is not to the chemical part where we are really good at, but it's all the hardware and software that is around. So you really need to uh, integrate this in something that usually is not standard. You can buy something in the shop, that, but so a lot of the work in this project was really to make these kinds of disposable electrodes that also work as a flow, and then to test them in a real situation. You can see that the real model that we found is much less fancy than the nice model that I downloaded from internet and that I used in the previous slides, but it works, then you can, this, this device can store the data and can communicate with an app on the mobile phone. This was all work done by Nokia and uh, uh, then you can read this thing. So uh, this is the actual situation of our work on sensors at European level in the flagship. Uh, what's the, the, the next field? Of course, it's to go even more complex, not just sensor in sweat, but as I said, graphene is very good to interact with the cells and with biological molecules. So there is work also ongoing in the flagship to use graphene as flexible electrodes for brain. It is not work that we do, it's, it's done by other groups. There is also a, a spin-off company that now is, is doing this. And as I mentioned before, graphene has lots of advantages on metal in flexibility, but even more in interaction with cells. What we are doing is are again to play with the chemistry of graphene to enhance its interaction with the biological molecules, but not only molecules, but even wall cells. Uh, this is a work that we did in, in the past year in ESOF, and you know that all cells are made of a membrane that is made of these molecules called phospholipids. Using the chemistry of graphene oxide, we could attach the same molecules on graphene oxide to enhance its interaction with cells. And we did some tests and we showed these kinds of interaction. This is all work that was done by uh, Valentina Benfenati and, and Roberta Fabri from, uh, from ESOF here. Uh, and the interaction is pretty good. So it's things that these substrates are very good to stick uh, to, uh, for cells to stick to and to proliferate. We tested it, uh, it on brain cells called astrocytes, and this is very recent work where we did use this, uh, this kinds of material not only to uh, fav favor the adhesion of cells on electrodes, but also to stimulate them electrically. An interesting thing is that using graphene or reduced graphene oxide, you can stimulate different uh, channels of the cells, in particular calcium, uh, release channels, and we observe that you can really uh, play with different channels that uh, that are present in the cells. But I don't have time to to uh, to detail more about this. And this is also it's it's still work in progress. And we have a papers under uh, referral and, and under evaluation at the moment. So I think I will conclude here. Uh, let me just conclude thanking all the people in, in CNR that did this work, in particular Chiara Zanardi that uh, is coordinating all the activities on, on sensing, uh, Emanuele Treossi for all the work on, on composites, and Valentina Benfenati for, for this new work on, on interaction with cells. And I also thank you for your attention. And uh, I'm done. Thank you very much. Thanks to, to, to questions if you have some curiosity. Yes, I would leave the question, the possible question at the end of, of the whole webinar, because, I mean, we, we, we have time because, as always, the, 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 the targeted end is uh, half past uh, um, 11, but we can uh, actually go until 12, so we have. Uh, Time until the 12, then our the transmission will be cut. Uh, so yeah, sorry, uh, there yes. was some crash. I uh, I don't know what uh, what happened. We'll have to inquire what so if it's something in in the presentation that makes it. Okay, I will stop sharing.
Thank you. So, uh, Vincenzo, you take over. Yeah, hello. Again, uh, I think Andreas, hopefully we have Andreas on the line. Still, still with us. Yes. Hello, he is. yes, of course. <laughs> Yeah, so, okay, so now we move to the second talk of the morning. Andreas Titel has a, has received a PhD in Stuttgart in, a few years ago, and now he is a group leader in the Eminator research program of BFG at the LMU in Munich, in particular the Center for Nanoscience. And he's a, <clears throat> he's a, works on light matter interaction and especially as far as I understand from his uh, from the handout uh, in, in plasmonics and um, optical methods for uh, for sensing so um, and his uh, his contribution today is nanophotonics for enhanced sensing and spectroscopy towards point care devices so devices devoted to to medical application and uh, uh, diagnosis and sensing I think uh, you can try to share the screen. Yeah, so so first off, uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, thank you also very much for the invitation uh, to, to present our results here. I hope you should see my full screen PowerPoint slides now. Yep, that's fine. Yeah, great. So yeah, like I, I was saying, I'm very happy to present our results on uh, nanophotonics for enhanced biosensing. Ah, something happened. Do you still see it full screen? Yeah, should be fine, right? Yeah, yeah, still see. It. I see my myself now as well. So let's see if I can minimize that. Okay, oh, that's nice. fine. And with a, a special focus uh, because we are in the sensors and measurement uh, systems track here on um, how these techniques can help to realize point of care devices. So first off, um, we can think a little bit about what the promise of point of care medical testing actually is. So think about um, just one time that you have been um, ill or not feeling well in the past. So uh, what are you doing? You go to the doctor, the Do doctor orders a lab test because he's not quite sure what, what ails you. Your specimen is taken, so this is quite normal, like you get your blood withdrawn or another sample taken. But then very often, if you go to the, your local doctor, the specimen needs to be transported. It needs to go in like some a little van and travel to a specific clinical laboratory to be analyzed. And there all these procedures are being carried out often by trained lab technicians. And then afterwards, the results need to be transferred again back to the doctor. And this seems like a simple thing, but at, at least for many local doctors, for my doctor, he gets a letter from the lab, which again takes uh, several days. And then once this letter reaches your, your, your family doctor, you come in for a second visit where the doctor um, discusses the results with you and um, prescribes some treatment or makes some diagnosis. But you as a patient, you are actually not very much interested in this whole cycle. You are just interested in the diagnosis and the treatment. So um, speeding up this kind of processes is actually in the interest of, uh, of uh, patients and could um, very much increase uh, the treatment so yeah like i said you are only interested in getting the correct medication or the correct intervention to make you feel better so accelerating this is really a quite important step and this is where point of care testing uh, comes in because it avoids uh, these um, complicated processes that may delay treatment decisions and there's also another emerging trend which is personalized medicine where really you want to improve your health all the time, like you don't just want to check your health like every half a year or every year when you go to your doctor, but you want to continuously monitor and improve. And for this, you need really some way to do fast testing and also continuous testing. So point of care testing uh, aims to solve this by providing medically actionable information directly where you need it. And this point of need actually can be many things. 
So first off, you may be all familiar with um, glucose testing, uh, for example, if you suffer from diabetes. So the point of need could be the patient's home, where every day you need to measure your glucose levels, actually more than once a day, um, to give the correct amount of insulin. It could be at the doctor's office, as I have been describing to you, uh, on the last slide where you get some blood withdrawn and you want to know maybe your cholesterol level or some other um, information from your blood. And finally, it could be also at the ho and directly in the hospital at the bedside, for example, for the detection of sepsis. So now you may ask if you are at the hospital, which usually has a large and sophisticated lab, why would you test at the bedside? But the reason is, um, if you really you have an onset of sepsis, every minute can count. And every minute that you detect the sepsis earlier can improve the outcome of the treatment and can uh, prevent the, in, in um, the extreme cases, the death of the patient. So point of care testing can help in all of these aspects and these rapid diagnostic results can really improve uh, patient outcomes. So now we want to develop um, a biosensor that is useful for point of care testing. So then we need to take a step back and ask ourselves what fundamentally is a biosensor. So really, if you go to the most basic level, a biosensor is a device that answers a biological question. And this can be many different questions. Uh, if you think about environmental monitoring, you may ask if there are some contaminants in your drinking water. Um, are there some pesticides in my food? Um, but if you go to medical testing, again, I gave you this example, how high is my blood glucose or what is my cholesterol level? And then, of course, these past years, we have all become intimately familiar uh, with the question, do I have a bacterial or especially viral uh, infection? And um, these uh, rapid tests are also an example of um, point of care testing because it provides you the information directly where you need it if you want to go to a restaurant, if you want to visit friends or family. So you want to know if you are infected uh, with this virus. So if we look at it a little bit more conceptually, um, a biosensor encompasses several different important elements. So first off, we have to consider the biological sample that we want to investigate, and I already discussed many of these application areas. And then you need in your sensor some sort of bioreceptor that captures the um, um, molecules in the bio uh, biological sample that you want to analyze and that you want to detect. And uh, there's different ways of uh, doing that. So you can use nucleic acids to bind these molecules, some proteins uh, that are conjugated um, uh, with the analyte that you want to detect, all the way up to whole cells that interact with some of these analytes and give you a response. And once you have um, captured the molecules that you want to detect, you need a transducer that transforms this um, attachment of the analyte molecules into some sort of signal. And there's many different ways of doing that. Uh, for example, electrical sensors that use a change of the conductivity, for example, or thermal systems that look at the temperature change when some analyte is um, attached. And of course, today we want to focus mostly on optical transducers that allow you to measure this from an optical signal. And then very often you need some sort of signal amplification because the analytes that you want to measure appear in very low concentration. And finally, you need some advanced uh, data analysis, for example, some filtering or even some machine learning approaches to allow you uh, to interpret the signal that you get. Now, um, again, I mentioned we want to do optical uh, biosensors. So what are the advantages of doing all of this biosensing with optical techniques? So um, uh, first, optical sensors are usually non-invasive. So you can detect some information on your sample just by looking at the light um, absorbed or reflected, for example, by it. So you have detection from the far field. You do not need to go into your analyte to detect. Then optical techniques are frequently label free. So you need uh, not put some fluorescent tags or other um, um, different molecules on the analyte that you want to detect, which can actually change uh, your, your sensor signal. 
uh, they have high sensitivity, so tracking spectral changes is very precise. We are building on many decades of work uh, on creating ever more precise spectrometers, so we can use all this technology to track the optical changes very precisely. Then with optics, you can do fast and real-time measurements by continuously acquiring the signal. And then there's also the possibility for multiplexing, so detecting multiple analytes. And then, um, and I will speak more about this in the later slides, you can do compact integration of these techniques on chip with on-chip light sources and detectors to get really compact and portable sensor devices. And then if we talk about compactness, this is where my main field of research comes in. You can combine optical sensing with nanophotonics um, to really scale down such sensors and create miniaturized uh, sensor devices. And our goal here is to go from a very complex and expensive optical lab equipment. So the image here on the left uh, shows actually um, uh, uh, spectrometer and microscope that was used for many nanophotonic uh, sensing uh, works in my group and in many other groups and it's very large cumbersome and expensive and we want to reduce this uh, to a small and compact device uh, that can potentially fit into the palm of your hand and can really then be used at the point of care offering great medical advantages as I have described. Now, the sensing technique um, on a fundamental level that we employ is infrared spectroscopy. So you can imagine we have an unknown a chemical or biological sample. So we ask ourselves, uh, what is the composition of the sample? What is the structure? So I'm talking here about the even secondary structures. So um, alpha helix or beta sheet conformations of molecules. And what are the interaction kinetics of the molecules with each other? And since we want to do optical sensing, what we do is we illuminate this unknown sample with light and study the reflection, transmission and absorption of the material, everything spectrally resolved using these advanced spectrometers that I have mentioned. And uh, what is nice about infrared spectroscopy is that the molecules themselves give you a toolkit to answer these fundamental questions because all uh, biomolecules have these um, characteristic molecular vibrations of their chemical bonds. And I'm showing here just a very simple example of uh, carbon dioxide. And even in such a simple molecule that you can have very distinct molecular vibrations such as the bending symmetric stretching and asymmetric stretching uh, vibrations here. And all of these vibrations have distinct resonance frequencies in the mid-infrared and can be used to uniquely identify the constituent atoms and chemical bonds. So this is a very powerful technique for optical sensing. And if you look at a complex biological sample, so here I'm just presenting a mammalian cell, you can look at the um, at the whole wealth of all of these absorption bands of the constituent, uh, constituent molecules. And these absorption bands form a characteristic so-called molecular fingerprint. And just as uh, your fingerprint, this can be used to identify all these molecules uh, in the system. And I'm just giving you here an example looking at the cellular membrane and we can actually identify the lipid molecules um, associated with the cell membrane. We can study transmembrane proteins. We can look at some phosphate and DNA uh, molecules here, and we can even look at the uh, characteristic carbohydrates that are very relevant, for example, for the metabolism of uh, cells. So it really excels at uh, investigating biological systems. Now, there are, however, some important limitations of um, infrared spectroscopy. So in general, if you think about uh, a light passing through some sample, the molecular signal vanishes exponentially with decreasing analyte thickness. So if you make the sample very thin, you will get less and less signal and it will be difficult to separate the signal from the background. And this uh, truly prohibits fewer single molecule measurements and makes it very challenging to investigate the relevant uh, biomolecules in many biological systems. So the physical reason for this is that 
the mid infrared wavelengths are actually on the order of micron, whereas relevant bioanalyte molecules can be on the order of as small as 10 or 5 or even 1 nanometer. So we have a 2 to 3 order of magnitude difference in the length scale, so the absorption um, cross-section is very low. So um, it's actually a, a bit interesting or a bit funny because I, I made the slide maybe 2-3 uh, years ago and back then I, I always needed to explain in my talks like what uh, microRNA is and why it's so small and what makes it powerful and of course now with all our vaccine experience i i don't need to do that anymore so we are all very familiar with what mrna is and why it may be important also to detect it for example for purifying or refining such vaccine candidates so to improve the overlap uh, and improve the sensing, um, again, we come to nanotechnology. So we empl employ uh, optical nano antennas to focus the mid-infrared light into tiny hotspots of the electromagnetic fields as shown here. And the nice thing is that these um, hotspots are now on the same order of magnitude in size as the molecules that we want to detect. So we get a very large, uh, interaction cross-section and we can really boost the signal from the small molecules on the surface and this is just a sketch here on the bottom right where you see the reference which is without the antennas where you see only a tiny modulation by these molecules and we bring in the, um, the antennas and then we have a large enhancement allowing us to detect these characteristic amide one and two bands of the proteins that we want to detect here. So I uh, told you that I want to do nanophotonics and also metasurface based sensors. So it's uh, useful to quickly think about what metasurface actually mean or what we uh, understand by it. So uh, meta comes from the Greek word, uh, which means beyond. So a metasurface is something that go goes beyond a, a known surface or beyond a known uh, materials. So this is... Um, um, 3D surface or 3D material, which is engineered to have properties not found in naturally occurring uh, materials. And similar as normal materials are made off of atoms or molecules and metamaterials, you can also um, think of them as being composed of uh, artificial uh, subwavelength building blocks, which we call meta units or sometimes meta atoms. And these can include, for example, plasmonic uh, structures, so little resonators that can control the light uh, on the nanoscale. And just a very, very brief uh, primer because we will be using these nano resonators a lot. So if you think about a, for example, gold sphere, you can excite this with uh, incident a light and drive a resonant uh, excitation of the conduction electrons and the metal particle and this can be used to concentrate the light and lead to very high uh, field enhancement here so we have efficient light concentrators and this makes them great optical probes uh, for sensing this is just a short sketch to visualize a little bit how the meta surface then can be put into a 1d so-called meta line a 2D meta surface or even a 3D meta material. So here are just a few examples of how this can look like. So there's really a, a broad palette of these structures, such as discs, antennas, different shaped rods, inverse structures. So we have a lot of design flexibility of making these meta surfaces. Now, when you employ them for um, infrared spectroscopy, for surface enhanced infrared spectroscopy, the um, common technology here is uh, gold nano antennas of different shapes. So you see here these rod antennas, here some uh, four antenna coupled system, or you can uh, implement antennas of different lengths to simultaneously detect both the lipids and proteins in the system. But what you notice is when you look at the resonance here of the antenna, this is actually very, very broad. So in terms of wave numbers, so this is several microns here, the range, so very broad resonances. And the vibrational bands that we want to detect are actually these very tiny, narrow dips here in the line shapes. You can see it in the top, in the middle, and also in the bottom uh, spectra. And this is... Uh, 
um, um, fundamental limitation of all metals that in the infrared they have significant losses. So if you see the resonance here, so before and after application of a molecular layer, you see that most of the signal from this, um, this antenna system actually remains unchanged. Like all of the all of the signal remains the same, and we have only a slight modulation here where the vibrational bands occur. So in uh, my group, we have asked ourselves, how can we improve this? So how can we go beyond uh, uh, this uh, technology and improve actually the retrieval of this molecular information? So and to to do that, we we need to improve several things. Simultaneously, we need to find a new resonator design that allows you to get um, uh, sharper and uh, uh, better resonances for pinpointing the mo molecular information. We need to go to different material system because again, the losses in metals are unavoidable. And then of course, you need to um, figure out the nanofabrication to make this all possible in experiments. And what we ended up with is uh, such uh, elliptical resonators here made of amorphous silicon, which is a lossless dielectric in the mid-infrared. And we found that we were able to make uh, resonances here that are extremely sharp and can be used to precisely target a given uh, molecular um, uh, vibration and to read it out with much higher sensitivity that was previously uh, possible. And this is uh, actually, the, as I said, the main uh, research uh, topic in my group. We call this spectrally selective metasurfaces because they really allow to pinpoint uh, specific biological information uh, with great accuracy. And uh, this will be the main example that I want to show you today is this a meta surface here that we developed to do spatial multiplexing and very high sensitivity detection of various um, biomolecules and also to engineer it towards point of care applications. So this again is the resonance uh, geometry that I was showing you and what we did was implement these resonators in a pixelated uh, meta surface as shown here. And each pixel in the metasurface, so the pixels are uh, in size of roughly 100 by 100 micro, uh, micrometers. Every pixel is engineered to be resonant at a specific resonance uh, frequency or resonance wavelength, whatever you uh, prefer. So for example, this orange pixel here is uh, resonant at this specific position at roughly 1520 wave numbers. We can design another pixel though that is resonant at roughly uh, 1680 wave numbers. And then we can do this over a whole range to cover a large uh, wavelength range of interest. And you may already guess how it looks when I bring in all the spectra here. You see that we can have a continuous mapping of uh, this whole spectral range and specifically we can get a one-to-one -one mapping between spectral information which is the resonance frequency of this pixel and spatial information which is the location of the pixel within this metasurface. So in a sense we have here created a spectrometer on a chip that is able to translate spectral information into a signal in a specific spatial location, allowing us to overcome the, the limitations of these bulky spectrometers that I have shown you in the beginning. So we uh, fabricated this in our clean room using electron beam lithography, and this is the full meta surface that we created, which uh, consists of 100 metapixels. The um, total size of this is a little bit above two square millimeters, so it is a macroscopic uh, kind of object. And again, as I mentioned, it consists of these 100 by 100 uh, micron metapixels, which are spaced by roughly 40 micron. And this is just a scanning electron uh, microscopy image here to the right, uh, showing you um, that this, these structures are really nicely rep rep reproduced in the fabrication. Now, to measure it, we use a mid-infrared imaging setup that can capture 
images of this fabricated metra surface at different uh, wave numbers. And you can see that for the specific wave numbers, you get uh, a reflectance signal only from those pixels that are designed to be resonant at these wavelengths. So you see everything is uh, working nicely. We see this linear scaling um, over the different uh, wave numbers. And we can use this data also to retrieve um, the um, full spectra of these uh, metasurface pixels. And you can see we have a quite nice and wide operating range from 1350 to 750 wave numbers in the mid-IR. So this is roughly 8 to um, 5.5 uh, micron, if you prefer to think in uh, wavelengths. And we can see that we have very sharp resonances here um, in the mid-infrared with quality factors above 100. So the quality factors defined by the resonance frequency divided by the full width at half maximum. And this is more than one order of magnitude higher than the comparable plasmonic designs that I was showing you in the beginning. So now you may ask how we actually do sensing uh, with, uh, with this approach. So first you record the reflectance uh, spectra of all these uh, pixels. Um, then you apply uh, some target molecule. In our case, we physisorbed a protein AG monolayer. And then you look at how the spectra of the individual metapixels change. And you see that in spectral regions where the resonance overlaps with a protein um, absorption band, with the vibrational band, you can see a decrease and broadening of these metapixel resonances. Whereas in areas where there is no absorption, the signal stays mostly um, unchanged. So if I bring in again all the spectra, you see that the envelope of the spectra very nicely reproduces the protein fingerprint that we want to detect. However, the, the advantage of this imaging-based method is that we can actually read out the total reflectance signal. So just we come in with broadband illumination, we take an image of this um, um, pixelated meta surface, and then we just look at the total reflectance signal. And this allows us to get an imaging based representation of the molecular information in the sample. So you can clearly see the MI1 and MI2 band here as high intensity regions of this image, which we call a molecular barcode of the protein AG. And to give you a little bit of an analogy, what we mean by molecular barcode, um, similar to when you receive a package from Amazon or from DHL or from um, anyone, um, when you scan the QR code that is placed on the package, what it tells you is that it reveals the contents and allows you to track the progress of your package through the shipping process. And very similar with our molecular barcode, by reading out the molecular information in this imaging based way, you can identify and quantify the biomolecules in the sample and track their reaction kinetics. And uh, on top of that, we actually have uh, significant advantages with this pixelated approach and the technological application. If you consider you have a sample with two absorption bands that are spectrally quite separate and that have different intensities. You can actually tailor your meta surface by using pixels that are larger, where you have just a small signal from your analyte, and uh, um, smaller, where you have a large signal to get a uniform signal to noise. And you can also tailor the frequency uh, steps to detect only at these absorption bands of interest. So we apply this technique to the three different fields of sensing. So I already showed you biosensing and diagnostics with the protein AG barcode. We did for material science by looking at uh, PMMA polymer. And you can see that it's actually quite different uh, here, the response. And then finally for environmental monitoring by looking at glyphosate uh, pesticide. And you see that already with your eye, you can do image-based uh, uh, pattern matching to uh, differentiate these three uh, kinds. And if I show you now a unknown barcode, you would probably be able to already tell me if it's more of a protein, more of a polymer, or more of a pesticide. So I just uh, briefly um, want to show you that this can also be applied to more complex biological systems. And to do that, we looked at 
um, at uh, so-called uh, lipid vesicles, which are important in the body as um, a molecular shuttles for target drug release or cellular communication. And specifically, we looked at synaptic vesicles, which are used to transfer information between neurons in the brain. So we made uh, some mimics of synaptic vesicles by placing um, a, um, a neurotransmitter inside these vesicles and attaching them to our sensor metasurface. And then by perforating these vesicles using a membrane toxic peptide, melatonin. And we could show that with our um, barcoding method, we can quite nicely track both the attachment of the vesicles and the release of uh, the GABA. And I'm showing you here just the final um, analysis where we could differentiate all the different biomolecules in the system. So the lipids, which, which stay mostly the same, even though you are making small perforations in the vesicles, the melatonin that uh, in the beginning is of course not present, but then gets attached to these vesicles and the release of the neurotransmitter, which is present with a high signal in this first step and then gets uh, released. And by recording this um, over time, you can actually get a real time uh, behavior of the system and a real time and detailed picture of the uh, um, neurotransmitter release process in the system. And um, uh, finally, um, this technique is also ideally suited for, again, point of care applications because you can integrate all of these components on a single chip by using a broadband light source and a broadband AR detector chip and really reduce the size, cost and complexity uh, of the sensor and really driving us towards miniaturized um, point of care biospectroscopy. And just as a, as a last point, in the interest of time, I think I'm approaching uh, the end. I want to mention that we also have very nice applications of this technique um, to machine learning. So we can use advanced pattern recognition techniques to analyze these barcodes and identify, quantify and track these molecules really with uh, unprecedented uh, sensitivity. Now, in the interest of time, I'm just leaving these other two examples here in the slides. So please, you can just take, take a look after and maybe take a look at our papers. So uh, in addition to spatial multiplexing, we also did multiplexing using the incidence angle. So I will just skip over this now to show you the biological application where we investigated um, some key biomarkers for tooth uh, development and um, 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 dental disease, which is also a very important uh, field of medical uh, diagnostics. And then uh, finally, we also applied the same metasurface technology at visible wavelengths um, to use uh, what is called refractometric sensing. And here we were able to go really to ultra low uh, concentrations of analyte molecules as low as 2.8 molecules per square uh, micron, which is really a tiny, tiny uh, concentration and really shows you how powerful these high Q, these spectrally selective uh, metasurfaces can be uh, for sensing. And uh, with that, I want to already come uh, to my conclusion. So I hope I have convinced you that spectrally selective metasurfaces are a powerful platform for nanophotonic sensing. Um, these metasurfaces are enabled by some uh, nice and new resonant physics. I have not spoken about this so much today, but I just want to leave the term here, uh, photonic bound states in the continuum, which is our main, let's say, physical foundation for our work. And these allow you to drive IR by spectroscopy really towards practical point of care applications. And if you are interested in a broader perspective on this um, surface enhanced, nanophotonics enhanced uh, sensing, we have just published a review article in um, Advanced Optical Materials um, called Trends in Nanophotonics Enabled Optophilic Biosensors. So this gives really a nice overview of the field. And um, finally, I also want to announce that I have an open position available. So if you are excited uh, to work in these uh, topics, it's a fully funded 
uh, two-year postdoc position with possibility for extension on nanophotonic light matter interactions. And with that, I want to uh, thank our funding agencies and of course, all of you uh, for your attention. Thank you, Andreas. Thanks very much. It was a, let's say from the point of view of a non-especially non expert, let's say, to be, uh, to be, to put it mildly, I would say especially compelling, very interesting. Um, so we, I, I remind the audience that we have the, the present your presentation and Vincenzo Palermo's presentation in the handouts uh, section or documenti section, I suppose, in Italian. Um, and you can pose questions and, and comments in the, in the chat or in the questions section, uh, again, in the, so yeah, waiting for, perhaps for, uh, comments from the audience. I, I was just wondering, of course, so you're, what you're doing is a spatial, okay, so the one you, you went in depth about is the spatially resolved, essentially. So you have a map of different, of different, uh, differently sensitive pixels, basically. Are these organized like in a spatial, like low frequency on one side, higher frequency on another side or something like this? That's one thing. The other thing uh, you said, okay, at some, uh, I can, you can read out basically from the attenuation, uh, you can read out a signature of something. And so how does it work? I mean, because of course you then have to say, okay, this signature is the signature of I lipid, uh, whatever. Is, that, is there a um, database or how do you do it? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, thanks. So uh, let me start with the first question. Um, in our um, uh, principled demonstration, our first demonstration, we had the pixels really just linearly. They were just linearly increasing uh, with the resonance frequency. But of course, uh, for practical applications, this is actually not uh, smart because you may have like some variation of the signal that goes like linearly over the meta surface. So then you would have like a systematic error in your system. You can imagine maybe you are illuminating one side of the meta surface a little bit more, another side a little bit less, and then it's difficult to, to find this out. So what we do these days is to actually randomize uh, the position mm -hmm. of these pixels. So you can kind of average out any large scale changes uh, in the signal. And this gives us uh, much uh, better uh, results uh, usually. And then um, for the, the second question was how you can actually find out like what molecules there are. Yep. And um, so first off, there's um, a large amount of database or let's say lit literature mm -hmm. work on just characterizing all kinds of molecules. So databases exist. But if you want to do like really precise measurement and quantification, what you usually do is create um, just reference measurements. So you take the same meta surface and coat it with a defined amount of the molecule that you want okay. to detect in pure form. And this is what I showed in the begin, uh, in the end, very briefly in this um, um, artificial intelligence angle, that you want to make a large database of these barcodes. And then you can use like um, the linear combination of the um, principal component analysis. There's many ways of anal uh, analyzing mm -hmm. this to find out then which signals are present in your in your analyte, and that's how you usually do it. Okay, so there's a uh, you have a kind of some kind of calibration, and, and mm -hmm. then this uh, you can yeah, I mean you can try once you know a few tens or hundreds. You can train a neural network and, and have it tell you what is what the content is. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, that's very interesting. And, and then you have this multi angle multiplexing, which will have to do with the fact of, let's say, it relates to. Does it relate to, um, let's say, to, to morpho space morphology of the of the species you're looking at, or something like this, mm -hmm. or? Um, this is just two, I would say, different technological ways of um, of, um, of implementing the same thing. So mm -hmm. the pixelated approach needs a pixelated detector as well. 
So, and uh, as you may know, in the infrared, like microbolometers, um, MCT detectors that are pixelated are quite expensive. So right now still, right? Our, our vision is that it will get ch cheaper in the future. And with this angle multiplexing, if it's okay in your technology application to have moving parts, if it's okay to have like, like two mirrors mm -hmm. moving to set the incidence angle, you can use a single element detector, which is very cheap. So it, de it depends on your, on your technological scope. Uh, that that you want to do. Of course, the most compact version will always be the on-chip pixelated approach because it can go on a tiny chip. But maybe your application doesn't need such a small device. Maybe it's okay to have like some little mirrors moving, and then you can uh, you can have this uh, angle multiplexed approach. So that's the main difference, a technological one. And well, last question. Then we, we go to a. Uh questions from the audience. Uh, so is there a specific applications that you have already, let's say, uh, close to the market? How difficult is it to, 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 to package and to, to and then commercialize it, but I suppose to package it in a, in a, in a foolproof way so that anybody mm -hmm. can use it? Yeah, so we, we are working on, on making the device, let's say, to really scaling it down and have an actual um, uh, device. Um, but the, the applications are really quite, uh, quite broad that, that you can target. So it, essentially, the final goal is always to go from uh, full blood. So really have this blood testing, have uh, mm -hmm. some sort of blood uh, panel uh, capability. And this is, I would say, what the main main thrust of our our work is. And then whether you do glucose or um, or um, cholesterol is actually in the end not so important because they are all detected in the in the same way mm -hmm. uh, via tracking some of the absorption bands. So this is the the yeah. nice thing about this technology. Like once you have the device, you actually can quite broadly select uh, the the analyte that you want to detect. And these are reusable, I suppose. So that the device is, is, is reusable. It's not uh, one one shot like a, like a COVID test, for example. Uh, it's a little bit of both. So it is a device, um, let's say like a small coffee machine. Yeah, you know, like mm -hmm. small coffee machine. And, but then the sensor chip, um, the, the meta surface, so the, what industry tells us, the best way is to have this as like a disposable cartridge. Mm. Oh, so okay. that, so yeah. you have this one cartridge, you put one drop of your sample in, and then you slot it into your, let's say, reader, which mm. performs the, the, the analysis. So this is what uh, our industrial partners tells us, that this is how people are used to do it in the hospital. Like there's many of this kind of like cartridge mm. tests. And that's also, you know, for the FDA and everything um, is much easier because in principle, our meta surfaces, you can clean them and you can detect the different analyte. Mm -hmm. But apparently this is much too complicated, like it's starting to clean them. You really may have just cross, throw them away. Yes, you may have cross contamination between no. patient samples and this is all a very big problem. So they were yeah. telling us, just make a cartridge, slot it in, throw it out, mm -hmm. and it's perfect. So interesting. Well, I guess it's Thanks. also Thanks better for the for the industry that, I mean, even from the economical point of view, they they want to have something disposable so that they get a continuous revenue. It's mm -hmm. just to further up the the coffee machine business model. That's yeah. of course it's uh, it's better from the economical point of view. Yes, and this is the secret reason I don't usually eat with. Yeah, that uh, <laughs> it's good business <laughs> to sell the cartridges. <laughs> You are 100 percent right of course yeah. so uh it's it's good that we still have Vicenzo Palermo with us uh, we lost Matteo he told me that his, his uh, network connection he sent a message saying that he's lost and so we are on our own so I have a I have a question uh from the from the chat here for uh, for Vincenzo Palermo 
That's uh, from Fabio Rizzo, who says the chemical functionalization of uh, graphene oxide or reduced graphene oxide occurs at both both faces of the sheets. How can this be controlled and how much does this affect the properties of the final material? Is it possible to control locally the distribution of the chemical reactions on the surface of the sheet? Mm -hmm. Actually, that's, that's a very interesting um, topic because of course, graphene and graphene oxides are two-dimensional material. It's a sheet, and a sheet has two faces. And there is also very interesting works uh, and very tri different tricks on how you can functionalize the two phases with two different things, with two different chemical moieties. Even the name of this object uh, is, is nice. It's, they are called Janus graphene. This comes mm -hmm. from an ancient Roman god that was famous because it was a god that had two faces, one smiling and one crying. Um, uh, I, I, if I remember correctly. And you can do it in, in different ways. The simplest way is to absorb graphene on the surface and then, of course, expose it to the reactant and only the, the upper face of the sheet will be will be exposed. This Then the surface can be uh, a flat substrate or even uh, droplets. Uh, uh, there, there is a, a lot of work in literature on, on, on Janus graphene, and we have done also uh, something on, on this. In this case, and now we are talking to, to uh, about applied uh, research and, and devices, and um, you don't get this nice order, so you don't have one single layer on one substrate. So Usually, you it, it will be an, an uh, necessary complication to try to functionalize the, the two different phases of graphene oxide differently. Uh, you basically work with graphene oxide in solution, you functionalize it, uh, both phases, and then you deposit, or you co-deposit it with, with other kinds of, uh, of molecules to enhance the, the sensitivity. So, to in, 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 in few words, uh, it is possible to, to make uh, Janus graphene to functionalize the different phases. You can even do it in complex multilayer structures, so you can deposit one single layer on, uh, on a substrate, functionalize, then deposit another. You can exploit uh, different electrostatics on the two phases to enhance this, this asymmetry. Uh, but in case of, of these kinds of sensors, this uh, is not needed. We have done it uh, in a recent paper uh, for for uh, batteries for uh, sodium ion storage, in which you mm -hmm. you can make multi layers of graphene. In this case, it's pure graphene with one spacer molecule in between. So you attach mm -hmm. these molecules, then you add another layer of graphene, and you make these multi layers with the spacers. But that was for uh, uh, for fundamental research, not these more applied sectors. It's a, a relative of uh, functionalized, uh, of uh, intercalated uh, graphite. That's a, a old, uh, an old concept that years ago. Yeah, yeah but in, uh, in graphite, uh, is you can intercalate, as example, lithium ions. That's why we have lithium oh, yeah. batteries. But sodium is more difficult. Uh, so. Again, thanks to the technology of graphene, we can now exfoliate graphite into graphene and, and then we can yeah, even reassemble like... it. But before yeah. reassembly, we can put some spacer in between. So we have more space and a different chemistry that allows to these materials to do something that intercalated graphite cannot do. Thank you. So there's an, another question for Andreas this time from Martina Banchelli who asks whether there's any possibility to use this kind of meta surfaces for surface enhanced Raman scattering. Yeah, why not? Uh, yeah, yeah, so so great, great question and it's a easy answer, yes. Um, so vibrational spectroscopy is you know mostly the same. So if uh, whether you do like Syra or you do SIRS, both uh, should be should be possible. Um, the use of these specific meta surfaces uh, based on the bound states in the continuum that I mentioned 
have mostly been used um, for Syrah so far, but not so much for SIRS. But I see no reason why it should not work, to be honest. Yeah. Thank you. Um, but I, I had a curiosity because I I couldn't really follow the the that part of the presentation when when Vincenzo was mentioning uh, this this graphene paper for de-icing or anti-icing, having mm -hmm. spent some part of my life in uh, on a de-icing pad on a plane, as many of us. Uh, I found this very interesting and I just wanted to ask if you could elaborate a little on how it works and how it, how it is how it is used and whether mm -hmm. it is a practical and cost efficient yeah that's that's a very interesting path also uh, that tells a lot about applied research because of course it's we we are collaborating with this uh, on this with Airbus and uh, when they first uh, arrived to us of course they were like most of industries uh, they heard about graphene and they said stronger than steel so the idea was to add graphene to carbon fiber composites just to reinforce them but then they they saw that the, the key issues are are different ones and so this is a problem that as a scientist uh, you would uh, over oversee and and not consider because really it's it's really a, a a resistance so you pass current in it and and it warms up mm -hmm. so you will say it's not a big deal you can do it with the copper wire or whatever but then when oh. you go to apply things it doesn't work and on an airplane because you want these things embedded in this epoxy polymer with the carbon fibers uh, mm -hmm. you, this, this, this changes inside, it should go to temperature. It's not possible with the, with the normal metal heater. And at the moment, the only practical solution that they have is to blow hot air in the fuselage where they want the, the deicing, which is really highly yeah. inefficient. That's why the airplane does not take off and we wait in the airplane until a, a vent arrives to, to spray glycol uh, and, and remove the, the ice. Uh, so I, I would have said that this was not really fancy research, but this is the kind of things that industry really need to to go forward. And the advantage of this graphene paper is that it's all based on carbon. You can really embed it uh, effectively in the multi-layer carbon fiber polymers, with, and this is something that is compatible with their production techniques. That's that's why they are interested. That's great. I think perhaps we have uh, we have Matteo back just with uh, with uh, audio, perhaps maybe not. I don't know. Apparently not. So um, yeah, I think we are more or less uh, running out of time. Um, I think it was an, an excellent, very interesting uh, couple of presentations. On different aspects, and I liked it very much. I liked both very much. So, so I, if I, I don't see further questions or comments, so I think we can uh, we can close this session. And I, I'm I'm pleased to thank you again, and it was a it was a pleasure to uh, to get to know you or see you again. And hopefully, we will have a chance. Well, we'll have a chance perhaps to meet in uh, in person some point in. Uh, perhaps in Berlin at, uh, at some event in uh, not in uh, this but it's, it's a comfortable way to to meet in uh, virtually but in uh, presence at work but also the buffet and uh, the dinner perhaps that's uh, mm. interesting as okay so thank you again okay and, and see uh, you in Berlin goodbye thank, thank you. you thank you goodbye bye, bye.